My name is Dustin Kelly, but everybody calls me DJ. I'm prior Army, serving as both a Ford Observer and a military police officer. I spent the last 14 and a half years as a police officer and detective in a large metropolitan police department. Two things that I've learned throughout my career. One, everybody has a story to tell. And two, the best stories are true. This is the DTD Podcast. In three, two, one, and we're live. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the DTD Podcast. This week in the studio, a retired United States Marine Corps major with 24 years of service, with time as both an enlisted man and an officer. During that time, he was deployed 10 times to over 60 countries. He's been to Afghanistan, the Horn of Africa, and Iraq, where he was responsible for planning and conducting hundreds of combat missions that destroyed insurgent strongholds wherever they may have popped up. During his time of service, he learned numerous lessons about leadership, humility, and being there to provide comfort when someone is in need. He's written a best-selling book about the time leading the men of 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, who endured some of the most intense fighting in the 2nd Battle of Ramadi. In retirement, he gives his time to veteran causes, working with Save the Brave, with the mission to stay proactive to the needs of the veterans that they serve. He's the co-host and producer of the Break It Down Show podcast, and he's here tonight to talk about combat, fatigue, family, post-traumatic stress, and taking care of the person to the left and right of you. I'm proud to introduce Scott Husing. What's going on? I just got to tell you, man, that was the best motivating, most rocking introduction I've ever gotten. That was oh, great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Chris, it. it's good to see you. I'm glad you're back. Everyone knows Chris, my co-host. So, we're here to talk about your career. We're here to talk about this book. It was an absolutely fantastic book. And as we talked before, there was so much that went into it that you don't see from a lot of people that are writing. They're scared to either talk about themselves or talk about what really affected them. And that's what I loved about this book so much. You were not worried about telling, hey, here's where I messed it up. Here's where I could have learned from it. And here's where I could have done better. So as we always do, let's go all the way back. Let's talk about your youth. What got you on this path to the military? Were you from a military family? And what kind of set you down this road that you went on? Yeah, I tell you what, uh, it's funny because I was, I'm going to share, uh, it's not not a true confession, but I was sharing this with some, uh, a room full of high school students. I was speaking at the Young America's Foundation at Reagan Ranch this week. And, uh, you know, I looked out into that sea of faces that these young conservative kids in their suits. And, and I thought these kids are light years ahead of where I was in high school because I did not start <laughs> off as a Marine officer uh, or a Marine for that matter. But, uh, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of supervision. I drank underage. I fought. I have, my first car was a motorcycle. I used to race it at high speeds, ran from the cops, got caught by the cops, you name it. Um, Luckily, a friend of mine said that uh, he had met these guys and uh, I needed to come down and I had no idea what Andy had just done. And he says, oh, I joined the Marines. So y you guys understand this when you go into the recruiter's office, it's just it's covered in camouflage and these guys are wearing all their medals and they're sharp and man, they can sell, you know, a catch a popsicle to a woman in white gloves. They're the best. And they're describing everything they could offer me. And as a kid that grew up leading this lifestyle of really high risk behavior, I just looked at these Marines and I thought, I've met my match. I've never found a group of people that is riskier than these guys. And I enlisted and went to Desert Shield, Desert Storm, found the error of my ways after barely getting out of high school with a stellar 1.24 GPA and went to college, did much better. And I felt that the Marine Corps had given me so much. And, and I share that story not because I like bragging about what a, a delinquent I was in high school and how I didn't apply myself, but 
it's a testament to what the military gives young people is that discipline and drive. And I did much better in college. I graduated in three years from Illinois State. And then a young sergeant, God bless him, he reached out to me uh, as I was applying to become a U.S. special agent. And he told me that if I came down and took a physical, ran a fitness test, he could get me to officer candidate school in a couple months. And the rest is history. And you propel my career uh, as an officer some 15 years later. That's where my story at Echo and Ramadi began, as I was very privileged to command over 250 young Marines, soldiers, and sailors. And at the time, in 2006 was literally the deadliest city in Iraq. Um, it was a it was a real redefining moment for what the military knew about urban combat. And these young men took care of each other and me better than anything I'd ever experienced in my life. Well, I want to ask kind of a question that it, it will sound strange, but I, I I think it'll lead us somewhere else. When you say you learned the era of your ways it, it, when you were enlisted. What I felt from the book, though, reading it is everything you took to being an officer, and it, I think it made you a better officer, was from that enlisted lifestyle. You understood what those guys under your command were going through top to bottom uh, every day of their life. I get asked the question a lot if being an officer or being enlisted made me a better officer. My answer is always the same. It's no. I, I don't necessarily attribute being enlisted to a stepping stone to being a better officer. But I, I will say this, it, it gave me absolute perspective on how valuable those young Marines time is. And I never wanted to squander that. I never wanted to waste it. I always wanted them to be doing something useful. I didn't have time, uh, nor did I allow mindless inspections of wall lockers and eight pairs of uniforms and it just it never made sense to me so i applied a little bit of what i had endured as a young enlisted guy and and made sure that if my marines were doing something it was always preparing for war it was always preparing for the next mission i, I think that the guys that i had in echo company weren't some hand selected special operations breed they were kids from all across america and, and the world in some cases that we just came together and because of the leadership at every single level, not just mine, we built a very cohesive unit that had this chemistry that was really unlike anything I'd ever experienced in the 24 years that I spent in the Marine Corps. Um, and, and you can understand this and, and many of the listeners can, is when you're in that type of situation in Ramadi, in uh, Iraq at the height of the insurgency, uh, fighting five, six, seven times a day. Uh, for anybody that's ever watched sports, the best analogy I give is it was like the Super Bowl of combat for infantry guys because we were just going at it constantly with a very well trained uh, enemy force and the type of leadership that these young men displayed and the and the courage they had was just so noteworthy. And it's really part of the reason that I wrote the book uh, was to capture that historical aspect of what happened in Ramadi, because I never wanted this story to fall underneath the shadows of the Fallujahs or the Baghdads or the Kandahars, because it was a really significant point. It was a turning tide in the war when, if listeners remember, George Bush had ordered the surge strategy and they thrust another 30,000 troops into Iraq to really hammer down on that resistance and all the pockets that were, were springing back up. It was like this giant game of whack-a-mole, if you remember, where we'd bash them to the ground into fine powder in Fallujah, and then they'd go to ground and they'd, they'd spring back up in a different city. So in 06 and 07, we really had the leverage, not only the personnel, boots on the ground, but also additional uh, air support and, and other enablers that really allowed us to be effective and fight and win in that country. Do you think that being in a uh, desert storm, you, you got to kind of fight in two different eras of the military. I, I, Chris, you and I have talked about that before about these different eras of military. Did you see a difference from desert storm to when you went back with echo and Ramadi? Definitely. I, I wrote a little bit about it in the beginning of my book because 
and it's interesting too now because you you gain a lot of perspective after time and and hearing other people's feedback too when you're a lance corporal at, at the ground level you really are a mushroom i mean you're just in the dark getting fed loads of it and you don't really understand the bigger picture you don't understand what's happening around you so as i wrote it, Desert Storm for me was almost a very forgettable experience um, because the war lasted for such a short period comparatively to what we experienced in a 20 year war uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. It was a very complex uh, dynamic situation in both theaters where the, the tactics were constantly changing there was emerging technology that was always being introduced to even at the ground level from defeating subsurface ieds to um, airborne threats to drones to intelligence gathering how we catalog people through biometric scanning from our soft partners that patrolled alongside of us there was just so much to do um, and, and i think back the amount of tasks that I gave those young 18, 19 year old kids on a daily basis was really overwhelming. I mean, they could go from, you know, doing door kicking and killing bad guys to being a garbage man to an insurance claims adjuster for stuff that the coalition had blown up to driving supplies to, uh, you know, handing out school supplies to kids that people would ferry over to us to really, you know, inspire people and, and give the, the locals some semblance of hope and you know after the tragic and woeful exit from afghanistan last year uh, a lot of people were talking about that how it was a failure how we lost and any veterans listen to this i'll share the same message that i always do is we didn't lose the guys at the tactical level did not lose that war we didn't lose in iraq we didn't lose in afghanistan if there was bad guys to kill we killed them and if there was people to help, we help them. And that's what we do. That's what we're great at. If there's blame to be placed, it's not on one president or two, or th but three. Three administrations failed to properly come up with an exit plan from Afghanistan. And the tragic results that happened were sadly broadcast across mainstream media. And those, those families are, you know, and the Marines that were injured are still struggling to get past that. My only hope, you know, is you guys can understand is you know we we learn from those mistakes and there's so many great examples and uh, i'll i'll tell you this there's a book that my computer is sitting on right now it's called operation pineapple express by lieutenant colonel scott mann who's a dear friend of mine getting uh, ready he, to talk to him in a couple of weeks yeah scott is uh one of the smartest guys i know um but also completely unvarnished in his re recounting of the story. Um, like us, you know, he's been there. He, he gets it. He, he's drank uh, the Kool-Aid at the ground level and, and has a real unique perspective, but also the experience and education to to share it and write about it and articulate it in a way that makes the other 99% of the population really understand that, hey, look, before we commit another, you know, treasure chest of national treasure, and human lives to a conflict zone, we really have to ask ourselves these questions. We really need to do that also by making sure we're electing the right people into office that have our best interests at heart, because I think that's been the sting that hurts the most for our warrior tribe that, uh, you know, what what did we get out of it? You know, what, what was the end, end game of all of this fighting, all the blood we shed, all the money we spent? Um, you know, as I, I filled up coming down from Santa Barbara the other day at seven bucks a gallon here in California. Uh, and you know, when I visit you guys down in Texas and they're complaining about four bucks a gallon, I know things have gone really, really wrong. So, uh, you know, I like, I just like to share that message, especially with the veteran community is, you know, those guys and, and women, they're all, they're all winners in my book. Scott, I'm going to back up for a sec. So just for our listeners sake, DJ asked you about, you know, being an enlisted person in the first Gulf war and then coming back as a Marine officer the second time around. What about the evolution um, from, you know, the invasion of Iraq and then on into the different phases that incurred leading up to Ramadi? Um, how did you deal with that as a leader in the Marine Corps? Well, I think that despite any anything people perceive through social media or mainstream media about 
what's going on in the military today, you know, whether they're, they're trying to inculcate our young warriors to critical race theory or use our military as this human petri dish, uh, which there's absolutely no place for that. Um, I think that as a leader, you have a lot of challenges, but one of the things that I relied on mostly was great mentorship from leaders that I'd had. And probably one of the best pieces of advice was just to listen and listen at every level, not just your, your superior commanders, but also the Marines that you lead uh, because they have so many great ideas. And if you can just shut up for a little bit and listen, I think that has been a real secret to my success back then and still to this day. And trust me, the irony is not lost on a guy that uh, writes for a living and travels around the country and stands on stage and, and talks all the time. But I, I think as a leader, when you're in those positions as a decision maker, you have to just listen. Um, and the evolution of war from Desert Shield, Desert Storm, fast forward to Afghanistan and, uh, you know, after 9-11 in 2001 to, you know, the height of the fighting in, in 2006, even to the drawdown, uh, things change so fast. Uh, I think it's maybe an 18 month cycle of relevancy that people on the ground experience, even in, or our air component, um, how, how they operate. I think that you could do multiple tours. Like, I mean, I did multiple tours in, in combat and, and every time it's different. So there's a, there's a learning curve. Um, one of the things that I attribute to the success of my Marines and the real metric of success for me was just bringing as many Marines home alive as I could. That, that's my metric of success. We did that through being students of the trade, um, through training hard and the military industrial complex and, and the military itself comes together and is supported with a phenomenal training program. So again, you know, if there's, there's people worried about, uh, you know, this country or our military circling the drain, so to speak, um, with all of these, you know, non-military related topics going on, I got news for people. We are still 100% the best trained, best equipped military on the face of the planet. And I'll tell you what, guys, I never lose a minute's sleep any night I go to bed since my retirement because, you know, I'm comfortable in the level of training that I pass down to those guys under my command at every level, not just as a, as a captain throughout my entire career, that they were trained well. And, and I, you know, take pride in that. And I, and I have great faith and confidence that this – next generation is really going to carry that mantle of responsibility forward because there's one thing I'm never accused of and I'm, and I'm accused of a lot of things sometimes, but one is never being a generationalist. I never look down at younger generations where people are constantly throwing millennials under the bus or Gen Z or Gen, Gen Y, whatever it is. I think that as, as DJ and I were talking about before we hopped on the show, there's a responsibility from leaders to share the losses, not just the wins, not just the medals and all the shiny stuff you wear on your chest, but really share the losses. And that takes experience because when you're on active duty, when you're in the military, everybody has this mask that they wear. And, and there's, there's, a, there's a reason for that. Uh, but also getting to that point in your life where you, you can honestly and realistically tell people that I failed a lot. I, I failed a lot when I was on active duty. I still do it to this day, but it becomes cliche, but it's so very true that not only by admitting the mistakes, you get better and you avoid them, but by sharing them with other people, you see that organizations become better because when you've got people in leadership roles that are willing to listen, they're willing to admit their mistakes and, and say that they failed at something, the whole team gets better. I, I think that there's a thousand sports analogies you could use, but they're completely applicable to what we do in the military as well, in my opinion. I want to talk about friction, Scott. It was a huge topic in the book. It was mentioned numerous times and even at the very end of it. I want to go what the definition of friction is to you and not, and then on top of that, not what the definition is, but what does friction mean to you and how does it evolve you? Well, as I describe it, it's that 
indescribable pressure that you feel when you're you're fighting and you're surrounded by complete uncertainty yet complete danger uh, and that was day in day out um, when we were fighting in in ramadi in 06 and 07 that friction is just another word for uh, a lot of things that people can relate to some people call it murphy's law if things are going to go wrong they will go wrong but even the smallest most mundane things always seem to take longer uh, you know driving across uh, a, a city that would normally take you 30 minutes going to normal speed when you're in a convoy with marines and there's bombs on the road that's friction because now that 30 minute drive has become a five hour evolution. It's really a day's work just to get from point A to B. And oh, by the way, there's a bunch of people out there wanting to kill you. And you know, that type of luster of combat or war that seems romantic to young Marines, it, it tended to wear off on a guy like me after being shot at so many times. Um, and as my buddy, who John, Mc, John McKay, who fought in Vietnam, reminded me of a story when I was up in San Francisco, he, he used to get shot at a lot in Vietnam and he, he looked around and he said, why are these guys shooting at me? I'm a nice guy. I don't understand why all these people are shooting at me, <laughs> but you know, the, the training kicks in and, and you ultimately look to your left and right and you, you take care of those people. And that, that term friction is just something that was kicked around and kind of stuck because everything was friction and some of it was self-induced friction. Some of it was stupid mistakes that we made. And a lot of it was on the spot learning that we had to do and you have to adapt and be fluid and, and be very patient, I think, as a, as a leader in combat, because uh, when you're at that enlisted level and it's your first deployment and you're 18 years old and a year before you were playing high school football, those things at that level seem very, very big. They seem very deadly. And when you don't have the right leadership around, that's when that's when mistakes are made. And I always knew that I had to be constantly flying at the the 30,000 foot level. And what great commanders do is not shoot the rifles. It's not throwing hand grenades. I, I mean, you have to do it sometimes, but really being a great leader is being a force supplier. and you know, we, we use this a lot and it's still to this day. Amateurs talk about tactics, professionals talk about logistics. And I think that we were really dialed into all of the support that was available to us in Ramadi at the time. And I leveraged that and I was kind of uh, a pack rat in the sense that, and I was greedy because I would ask for everything and expect nothing. But I always wanted to make sure the guys were supplied with everything they needed to fight and win every single day. Well, you, you mentioned that, that uh, command about shooting, throwing grenades, things like that. That was what was interesting to me in the book. You went out on a lot of patrols. You said it a couple times in the book that your guys weren't going to go out on a patrol. Your guys go, weren't going to fill sandbags. They weren't going to do anything that you wouldn't do yourself. And you saw numerous other leaders over there not doing that. How does that set you apart? And I guess the real question to that would be when it sets you apart, it seems like it could be two different ways with your enlisted, with your guys. Hey, it's great. He's part of us. He's one of the family, but to your counterparts, it could be a very, uh, divisive situation that you put yourself in with them. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I'd agree. I think that, uh, it wasn't like I was walking around with a, a checklist in my hand, making sure that I did all these things. Like there's some tactical officer guidebook. It just, and, and again, you know, there might be some credence to your idea that me being enlisted didn't, you know, lend itself to being a better officer. But I think that that's very common. I think that for the Marine Corps and the Army that we fought alongside, the types of leaders, not just officers, but junior enlisted, the, the non-commissioned officers, the senior enlisted, the majority of those people, they're always out there on the street on those patrols, moving gear and, and making sure that the, the boys are being taken care of in, in, in most cases. The examples of poor leadership of those that didn't want to go out, that didn't want to risk and uh, led 
by you know computer and by PowerPoint, they're, they're pretty rare. But I think it's important too to to really be honest with our organization and, and tell people that you know this type of leadership exists too, even in the military. We're not exempt from bad leadership, but I think even when I looked around, I saw those examples of bad leadership. I took notes because those were always examples of what not to do. And you, you learn from that as well. Scott, did you have any thing that stands out leadership wise for you um, as a subordinate, either as a prior enlisted or in your early career as a Marine officer? Was there a specific example where, you know, a guy looked out for you, guided you, uh, provided some some support, whatever it was that had an impact on you that kind of helped influence how you interacted with your soldiers and your command later on. Absolutely. There, there's hundreds. Um, I think that um, specifically uh, throughout my career, I've, I've been very fortunate to have a ton of great leaders, uh, many of whom I still keep in contact to this day from company commanders to senior enlisted, um, some of whom are now civilians or retired field grade officers and sergeants majors who are they're still doing what they're great at. They're over in Ukraine advising. Uh, they they tempered me and mentored me my entire career. Um, in Iraq alone, I was very fortunate. I worked for the Army uh, for a, a task force in Ramadi, Task Force 19 Infantry, which was commanded by Colonel Chuck Ferry, <clears throat> who I still talk to to this day. But all of those commanders that were several ranks above me they gave me a lot of leash and they did it because they had confidence in me, but also because we produced results and um, they kind of liked that uh, operational style. And, and I think it was the aggressiveness too, that we brought to the game when we showed up in Ramadi with over 200, you know, hard pipe hitters, you know, carrying everything in the kitchen sink um, comparatively to the, what the army was having to deal with because they lost so many guys the company strength was about 80 to 100. So we did look like rock stars when we rolled in there. But Chuck Ferry, um, you know, Bear Johnson, uh, Sean McFarland, uh, all of these guys from the brigade level down um, gave me a lot of trust and confidence. Uh, they gave me a lot of support. And even when things went bad uh, within, within units, and, and they do, uh, you know, we were investigated for – um, you know, it could have been a minor infraction. It's part of the game when you're at war uh, and it's a challenge. But uh, the best thing that they did was take me aside, let me explain, and then they bring all the information to bear and then they support you because there's a lot of decisions that present themselves um, at the ground level that you have to make. And when they're viewed at a top level, they may seem a little bit different. So I was very lucky to be surrounded by a lot of great leaders. And I think that, um, you know, things could have played out a little bit differently for me personally, um, had I not had um, those people to give me some rudder steer along the way. They, they were, I was really lucky. I'm glad Chris brought that up because I let's talk about that right now. We're going to jump around a little bit, but I want to talk about one of those times where your command kind of took you aside, talked to you, asked you the story. I want to talk about the mosques and the insurgents that were hiding weapons inside them. You got the all clear to go after it. Now, the way I understood it from the book, you were told one mosque, but ended up with three. Um, let's kind of lay that out. What happened? Because there was a, a, a multitude of things that went good and went wrong with that mission. And then ultimately, let's talk about what Chris was saying. Those guys that are mentoring you along the way and telling you this is how we can do it better. Yeah, that night uh, we had had multiple patrols out in zone. We we pushed west to a city that needed to be cleared called Rutba. It's on the it's like a truck stop on the on the Syrian border of Iraq, and uh, we'd been in the city for a few days. And at up until that point, there was not a lot of activity. And one of my interpreters was on a patrol, Big Sam, and. He came back to the combat operations center and which sounds sexier than it is. It was some dude's house that we took over and kicked him out in the street um, because we needed a place to operate. Um, we took care of him. He, we didn't leave him living in the street, but he was uh, on an extended vacation with some family. But my Terp came back and, and Big Sam told me that um, they found some letters that indicated that all of the insurgents in town, a couple hundred of them, 
uh, were ordered to bring all of the weapons they could bring to bear, take them to every one of the mosques, hide them in the mosques, and then they were going to launch a coordinated attack on the Marines in zone. And at the time, there were probably um, three independent Marine Corps units operating in Rupa. We had some force, uh, force reconnaissance guys to the north. We had some special operators to the north. And then we had my company, which was spread out throughout the town. Um, and when we got that, um, I made the phone call back to the Marine Expeditionary Unit uh, Operations Center, told them we found a note in a mosque and requested permission to enter the mosque. And uh, they approved the request, came back um, after the request that there were multiple mosques involved in this. And uh, I made sure that I talked to Big Sam and validated what he'd read in this letter. And he, and he confirmed it. He said, no, sir, they're, they're taking them to all the mosques. So I looked at the map, looked at the computer, saw where all my units were, and I ordered them to, to raid all the mosques simultaneously. What would have been a great bathing success of, of glory um, was kind of overshadowed because one of my Marines went into one of the mosques in zone and, and someone ran out in the shadows. It's pitch black. It's probably three in the morning. And uh, someone moved aggressively towards him. Come, and she fired his weapon. And unfortunately, it was a female civilian who panicked and got caught in the crossfire and, and shot in the in the arm. And at that point, the operation had really come to a screeching halt. We detained all the weapons. We, we secured hundreds of weapons, by the way, um, through, through the Marines' efforts. And we wound up taking the female who'd been injured, um, not critically, to a local doctor. Um, he wouldn't treat her. There was no clinic in Rupa. They recommended they send her to Ramadi. Her brother shows up. We gave him a bunch of cash, which we always carried around with us. And he said, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to take her to the hospital in Ramadi. We're going to get her fixed up. And then the next morning, who do we see bebopping down main street on MSR Michigan, but her brother and the sister. And he had her arm bandaged up and didn't take her to the hospital. So, you know, despite our best efforts in, in trying to help people, um, you know, you know, you can only do so much um, because at, at that time, again, we weren't allowed to take care of civilians. We weren't allowed to provide medical care to civilians from our military uh, corpsmen, our military doctors. They were on their own, but we did provide them with resources in a, in a pocket full of cash. Probably like, and when I say a pocket full of cash, it's like 800 bucks I think I shelled out to this guy. Um, that's a lot of money in Iraq, by the way. Uh, that's probably like a half year's wages. So. We, uh, we tried to do our part, but again, it's, you know, it's a very dynamic situation. And um, when you're making those types of decisions, you know, at the end of the day, there was probably, you know, close to three, 400 weapons that were off the street that weren't going to be in the hands of bad guys shooting at my Marines. And that was my goal. And, you know, unfortunately, sometimes bad things happen. There's two things that come up with that, Chris. Uh, and, and I want to ask you, I want to tie you into this question. Uh, I want to talk about negotiating with locals. Uh, you mentioned it in the book, Scott. Uh, and the, I guess you would call them blood payments for the accidental deaths. Uh, you guys have both seen it. Um, one, I want your thoughts. Scott, I, I'm pretty sure I know what your thoughts are, but I want to hear you talk about negotiating with the locals, these blood payments, because you just mentioned it just now. You give this guy $800. He says he's going to take care of it. You see him the next day. At a certain point, it's got to get to where it starts needling you. It's frustrating, but uh, one of the things that we learn from both our, our time in Iraq and Afghanistan is how woefully inept we are as a military force to deal with culture. Um, we've had some great senior leadership that's really understand how important culture is. And, and I subscribe to that to a degree. Um, but again, you, you can't send a bunch of, uh, you know, anthropologists into a combat zone or sociologists. You just can't. So you can't learn everything about culture. But one of the things that you have to understand about the Middle Eastern culture is, or the Arab culture is, that lying in normal conversation like this is completely acceptable. Um, it, it just is. And for most Americans, it's very, very hard to grasp that. They have a very hard time understanding. It's like, 
why would they lie about something so important? Well, it's, it's because it's part of their culture. And it, it's, it's just like Americans lie about how, you know, good their girlfriend looks in a certain pair of jeans. I mean, it's just acceptable. Like you wouldn't tell the brutal truth uh, because that's not in our culture. You, you tone things down, but as an operator, when you're trying to be effective on the battlefield, it, it becomes frustrating but you also learn to deal with it. And luckily for us, we had a lot of good interpreters that really understood that. And, you know, most people don't understand the difference too between interpreters and translators. Like a translator just is, you know, meat in, sausage out. Like that's all you get. Having a good translator, those are the types of people with units that they understand body language, they understand culture, they understand tribal uh, relations and they can communicate that to the commander so you can make better decisions as you're fighting on the ground. So um, yeah, it's frustrating, but it's also part of the job. And I think that it's a lesson learned from both wars that we need to get better at. Um, should we replace cultural training with uh, shooting your rifle and hitting the target? There's a balance, but at the end of the day, we're a war fighting organization, not uh not a social organization. And, you know, that's, that's what we're great at. Yeah, Scott, I, I, I guess I'll expound on that a little bit. I've always said, you know, like it or not, as a service member, you're an extension of U.S. policy. Um, but on the other side of my mouth, I've also said that, that soldiers, Marines, special operators, what have you, you know, they're designed to close with and kill the enemy, to seize terrain, to hold terrain, et cetera. They're not designed to be diplomats or nation build. Um, but, just like our tactics, techniques, and procedures evolve over the years, you know, so does the enemies on the battlefield. The mosque scenario is a great one. Like they figured out um, what we would and wouldn't do at a certain point, and and they made adjustments to their TTPs. Uh, and and with our rules of engagement evolving over time as well, um, because you had you had diplomacy intervening with war fighting, um, and it was kind of a blend. Uh, was there ever a time when you were just ridiculously frustrated with rules of engagement or did you always manage to to flex and react to those and adjust accordingly? Yes, I was frustrated. Um, I think the rules of engagement changed a lot from really the outset of the war. And I, and I think this was a, a failure from the Bush administration where they were really quick to what we what we call you know take off the iron fist and and put on the velvet glove to be a kinder gentler military where we started transitioning into support and stability operations when there's still bad guys to fight you, you just can't do that and and the rules of engagement were complicated they were um, a little too verbose for my my taste um you know i wrote about how from the spectrum of the rules of engagement from Ramadi, where they were very permissive, transitioning to the Western part of Iraq and the same deployment became very restrictive. And it was a challenge for the Marines. And I, and I say this a lot, you, you know, I could give, you know, you a, a machine gun and a box of ammo and a little bit of training. And I'm pretty confident, Chris, you can go uh, with some, some, pretty mission type guidance and, and go from zero to 60 and attack and kill the enemy with, with pretty good results. The real challenge for a leader at every level is to get that same young person, that same machine gun to go from 60 to zero. That's a real leadership challenge because training for boredom in the absence of the enemy is really something that we don't train to. Um, but it's also part of the job. And that's a real tough thing for guys to understand. And when there's only one commander, uh, you have to have a lot of faith and confidence in those you've trained below you at every level to make sure that that young 18 year old kid doesn't go out on his own and, and make those decisions. And it was tough for, for policy and rules of engagement. Uh, you know, my solution to it was in every vehicle, I had them taped to the window. In every post where there was a machine gun, they were taped to the sandbag or whatever was available. and the small unit leaders were responsible for briefing those before every patrol stepped off, just so it was in the front of their brain housing group. And they understood 
this is how I'm supposed to act. It may not have been how they wanted to act, but we had a responsibility and the rules of engagement are there for a reason. And I never was cavalier about it as frustrating as it was because, you know, you can take that example in the mosque where that, that young woman was shot in the elbow. Um, you know, it was, it was horrible. I, I, I felt horrible for her because I never looked at the uh, Iraqis or Afghans when they got caught in the crossfire as collateral damage. They're not collateral damage, man. They're people. You know, they, they were invaders in their country. Um, you know, we look like spacemen from Mars coming down with all of our sexy kid. And, you know, every Humvee is a tank to those people because they don't know any different. And we have a real responsibility because they grew up just like we did. They want to go to school. They want to drive their car when they're of age. They want to go to the soccer game and see their kids get married. They're people. So to think that they're just collateral damage uh, is really just a, a really narrow-minded way to look at how you fight on the battlefield. And I think that's been pretty timeless for all war fighters across every war that we've fought in, to be honest with you. I want to ask you what you think of this statement, and then we'll kind of expound on it from there. You write in the book, what makes us good, what makes us great is the brotherhood. And you go on to say, no one single person, it takes the whole group. But it almost seemed to me like when I read the book that that there were individuals that really stuck out to you in your command. There were really people that 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 made this a memorable time in your life. So I want to ask about that first and why it was so important for you, one, to command and why it was so important for you to be close with your enlisted. I think that if I would have had enough pages, I would have written a story about every single Marine that was in my command, but that would have been a very long book and no one would have read it. And uh, the, I, I shared this story recently. Um, I was in South Carolina on board the USS Yorktown and we were doing a panel discussion. And one of the Marines I invited was a squad leader of mine, Brian McKibben, who I wrote about in the book, by the way, he, he's the sweaty Marine. And uh, he's still in the Marine Corps to this day. And I, I was talking about how, um, you know, I, I was not there to be their friend. And, I, I, you know, after the panel discussion, Brian kind of pulled me aside and, you know, he says, hey, sir, you know, I, I kind of took offense to the fact that, you know, you said we weren't friends. I said, well, we're friends now, Brian. I said, but back then you didn't need any more friends. And just like a parent, you only have one parent. You, you, in combat, you only have one commander to make those decisions and protect you. And I think that you could be close and have a great deep love for those you lead, uh, but you can't be their friend. Um, you, there's just no room for it. Uh, I think that the great leaders that I've met in my life also understand that the military and, and military-like organizations are really great about plastering the walls and the locker rooms with all of these charts with leadership traits and principles and characteristics of justice and judgment and decisiveness and courage and loyalty. But the real great leaders, in my opinion, they read in between those lines of the, the textbooks that professional warriors read in the schools we attend. And those are words like love and compassion and understanding and caring. Um, if you can grasp those, I think that those types of leaders in any setting are really the ones that stand out and make the difference. So it wasn't about friendship. It was about making sure that you, you're taking care of those that you're entrusted to lead. And I, I think that, you know, when I look back on my time uh, in that period, in that command was, uh, you know, I, I tried to promote that and, and let those men understand the significance of what they were doing. I think that's tough too to really make time under those types of circumstances too to, to really let them understand what's happening two, three levels above them. And it, it's also kind of humorous because after I wrote Echo and Ramadi, a lot of the Marines, especially the ones that I wrote about, uh, came came to me and said, you know, some of the effect like, you know, holy shit, sir, like I had no idea what you were dealing with at your level. And had I known, I probably would have complained a little bit less or done my job a little bit faster. But, you know, that's just the nature of, being in charge of a large organization and all of the characters that I wrote about in, in this book, I think at the end of the day are emblematic of all of them. You know, again, if I would have 
written about all of them, it would have been tough. I would have loved to do that. But the ones I picked really speak volumes about every single Marine that fought under my command. The reason I ask that is because I want to flip it to the other side of that coin. And this really stood out to me. I say that you were close. You say that you weren't friends. I, I have had in not only the military, but in law enforcement, leaders like you that are close that feel maybe they're not a friend, but they feel close where you feel you're covered and you'll cover them and do anything you need to for them. But then I read about your XO and some of the officers that work for you. And it was a completely different mentality. And I think you would agree with me. You even write it in a different mentality in the book. Your XO, you tell numerous times, just get it done, XO. You would never say that to one of your enlisted guys. And as a matter of fact, you do multiple times in the book where you say, my enlisted guys, my Marines always figured out a way to do whatever it is they needed to do. And that's speaking about when they hooked up the stereos and the speakers and played music they weren't supposed to, different things like that. You would agree. You treated your officers different than your enlisted guys. Uh, absolutely. Um, the officers that I had in, in that unit were relatively new. They, there was plenty of enlisted Marines that had more combat experience, more deployments and, uh, you know, more education on the battlefield than they did. But that's a decision you make. And again, I can, I can use um, my own personal experiences comparatively because I was enlisted. You can stay in the military for 20, 30 years as an enlisted person. And that's a decision you make because as an officer, you're accepting more responsibility uh, because you become a decision maker. It doesn't, it's not a matter in my opinion of being better or worse or anything like that. It's really about the level of responsibility and the decisions you're willing to make that affect more lives. I've been surrounded by plenty of senior enlisted soldiers and Marines that could outread me, outrun me, outthink me, outsmart me. But at some point in their life, they made a decision to stay enlisted. And um, surround, when you're surrounded by so many guys like that and lean on the people uh, that are under your command, I think it's absolutely the secret to my success is I, as i started the show off it's no secret now that i'm not the smartest guy in the world but i am smart enough to surround myself with smart people and throughout my career i think and to this day i, I continually seek those people out probably one of the things i failed at the most was i allowed myself to be surrounded by people that weren't so smart and i endured and suffered some fools earlier on in my career everybody does it you gain a lot of experience and and wisdom along the way and now at this stage of my life i'm i'm pretty uh well calibrated machine as, as far as bullshit meters go and i've learned to just cut those people out of my life like a cancer because they don't serve me i i think that being in this position too where i can share that with active duty uh, military units and, and even some veterans it doesn't really I don't know if how much difference it makes to those guys, but for the people that are going to be the future generation uh, who are going to be fighting the future wars, I think that that information and that, that wisdom is really essential. Let's go on and let's talk about some of the people that you talk to and talk about in this book. And I, I think they're important. I want to start out with the Downings. Uh, they seem to be a major point in this story. I want you to talk about Ryan um, some of the stuff that you saw in him with PTS, things like that with his mother. And then I want you, if you can, to compare it kind of to what you felt after you got out. Well, Ryan Downing was, uh, a 2004 Ramadi vet. He, uh, was a Lance Corporal young fire breather. He's just, you know, skinny bag of rags, uh, couldn't have weighed more than 135 pounds soaking wet. And, you know, probably uh, with all of his combat gear topped in at about 165. But, um, you know, again, he wasn't, a, he wasn't a stellar Marine. He got in his share of trouble. Um, but at the end of the day, he also knew that I was going to take care of him. And when he did get in trouble, I explained to him that, you know, hey, when you screw up, you don't get punished because of what you did. You, you're getting punished in fairness to the other 200 guys in this unit that are doing the right thing. And as we fought and, and Ryan was injured again in combat, 
uh, and he got medevaced, it was extremely important for me, like every family member, to pick up the phone and, and call his mom to make sure that she understood uh, what was going on, how Ryan was being taken care of. And it wasn't until I wrote the book and I started doing the research and talking to some of the family members where that story of Kimberly Downing and her whole family, Ryan's brother Justin and his dad, both Marines in combat all at the same time, and the mom being completely isolated in a small town in Iowa, you know, with no support, no military base around her. I mean, that had to be stressful. So when you're you're thinking about the stresses of combat too, you, you've got to think about the other side and the families that support you and what they're dealing with. And I was extremely grateful for that whole family being able to share that story with me. And, you know, you talk about writing the story and, and sharing something like this, that's really intimate and very personal. A lot of people will ask me the question, how long did it take me to write the book? And I tell people, from soup to nuts, when you sit down at the computer and you write it, it took me just over a year doing all the interviews and everything. But really, the answer is 10 years. Because had I written this particular story, when I came back from Ramadi, it would not have been the same. It would I would not have gotten those types of stories that I wrote about the Downing family or the others, because like many that experienced that level of trauma, uh, it's 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 so many different stages of their life. It takes time to process that and unpack all that trauma and really come to grips with it and also to share it. So I don't think that I would have gotten those types of stories had I written the book right when we came back. So as people know, timing's everything. So I was I was pretty, pretty grateful. And, and to this day, we still keep in touch. And that's kind of the beauty, too, of sharing you know, so many personal stories that I, I captured in the book, um, you know, people tend to stay connected, they want to be connected. But you know, at the same time, there's people that I've written about in the book, I haven't heard from them in 14 years. And that's just the nature of things too. Sometimes people like to leave that all packed up and they'll dump that suitcase on the bed and, and deal with it when, and when they're ready. A little more into the Downings, um, there was a lot of uh, PTS that happened when you when you talked about um, calling his mom, and and you really talk about the story where he felt like you called his mommy and told on him when he got in trouble the second time because she made you move him. Um, you're taught as an officer, and and I, I'm just guessing here, taught how to write letters, right? When someone's injured, when someone's killed in action. You're taught how to write a letter, right? No, you're not. They they don't give you a class on that. They, they don't. I, I thought that you talked about something in the book where there was something about where they Yeah, there there might be there might be some commands in some random schoolhouse that make you write a fictitious letter of to the parents of a Marine that just killed, but I honestly think it's by design. Like they don't want you to do that because they don't want you perseverating on those grim aspects of it. I think when the time unfortunately presents itself that most officers and, and most people in positions of responsibility are going to have the education tact and, and understanding of how delicate those things are. Um, I wrote all those letters, uh, I'm, but I also made the phone calls because I wanted to talk to a human being and, and let him hear it in my voice, how utterly sorry and, and, uh, you know, sad I was about uh, what happened and there's nothing you can do to change the time. But every single time you do that, uh, you really understand how much those families who care and they can just continue to love you and support what we were doing over there because at the end of the day, that's their kid and they raise them and they, they raise these great Americans that are just willing to do these superhuman acts in the face face of you know great uncertainty every single day and that's the beauty of america man I, I tell you it's it's a small segment of our society that is still alive and well in my opinion that we're you know the only service branch the marine corps that met our recruiting goals this year because there's something about our organization that you know we're really tapping into because we're not we're not selling an education we're not selling um you know a lifestyle we're, we're, we're selling the Marine Corps, we're selling America. I, I, I'll be honest, the other day I was 
watching some TV and there was an advertisement for the army and you know, I love my army brothers, but boom, right on the screen. First thing, $50,000 bonus, 50,000. It we're appealing to someone's bank account to serve their country. Um, I, I think that we could resurrect, uh, you know, private military contractors to do that <laughs> and have them fight the wars. When we're building an all volunteer army, we need to really be focused on what makes people join. And it's an organization that really builds character. Uh, it, it's really that replaces something that we didn't have growing up. I think for the majority of people that serve in the military, myself included, come from some sort of broken home, some sort of uh, troubled childhood or dysfunctional family. And it, I think probably subconsciously we're seeking out that type of unity, that type of brotherhood and sisterhood that the military affords us. And the Marine Corps just kind of makes it that much harder to get in. We're, we're the toughest branch to get in as far as um, test scores, physical fitness, all of the above. Um, but I think that every single service branch offers uh, young applicants straight out of high school something very different. And I think it's a sad indication. I'm not bagging on the Army in this regard. But when I see a commercial and it's all about the money, I think, man, we've jumped the tracks a little bit. I'm not saying we've derailed. I'm saying we skipped the tracks a little bit on who we're recruiting into our military. Yeah. One, just to back up a minute, like that communicating with the family, like writing those letters and then making those phone calls, Scott. I, and, you know, maybe like all the listeners don't know how that works, but there's formal notification that takes place in the event of a, of a casualty or, or, or God forbid, a, a killed in action. But like those extra things that you did, th those aren't at least not in the army. Those aren't required. Um, and the significance of it is huge. I spoke with a brother of a guy that was killed back in 2003 with me during the invasion. And this is almost 20 years later. And he had never, ever been told the story of the day of his brother's death. So he didn't know mm. what happened, what occurred. He literally had gotten his information from things that had been written on the internet that he had dug up over the years. And, and that was profound to me. So like to hear you say that, like, and I want to make that point and stress that point, like, that's not the norm, but it's absolutely a huge deal and important. It's important to the families. And, you know, a lot of kids, they join the service um, for one reason or another. And, and even like me, you don't know how your family really feels about it, even if you have prior service history in your family. But God forbid anything ever happened to you, like them getting that information and hearing that and knowing that, that you, you died or were injured you know, doing your best to, to, to protect and defend the people on your left and right and to support your country. Um, that's a big deal. So hats off to you for that stuff. And it was cool to, to read that and hear that. The second one is the recruiting thing. Yeah. I, a, a lot of my colleagues and retired <laughs> guys, we talk about that a lot about how, you know, the services aren't meeting their numbers. You know, the army's not meeting its numbers and that money thing. You know, there's some incentives that work to get, you know, some people to come in and you need those those turnover bodies. But the guys that make it a career, the guys that spend, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 years in the service, they're not doing it for 50 grand. Like, you're absolutely no. right. It's a, it's a completely different calling as to why. Um, and then I think there's another division of people that it evolves during their service and, and why they came in. But but yeah, I, I totally agree with that. But I just wanted to acknowledge like the fact that you did that. I think that was awesome back then. Yeah, we, and, and it's really important. We want to make sure that. that we're getting rid of, uh, you know, up to 60% of first term uh, enlistees uh, in every service branch. I, it may be it may be less than that now, but that's by design. Most people think like, oh, you're going to get rid of like, well, it's by design because we understand that we're going to flush some people that don't really want to be there. They figure out like, ah, you know what? This probably wasn't for me for a career. Uh, there's other people that want to move on and get educational uh, assistance and, and better their, better their lives or maybe come back in the military like me. It, you know, I didn't want to be enlisted my whole career. Um, and I made that conscious decision. I think organizationally where we need to focus is the, the first and second term uh, soldiers and Marines that serve 
really incentivizing them and creating something within the budget where, you know, we make it more appealing for them. Um, you know, one of those things just, it seems like a shiny object, but when you re-enlist in, in the military, if, if you've done four years uh, and deployed and been successful, there should be just a little bit more than a, a re-enlistment bonus. It, there should be something that is memorable, not just getting promoted on a, a piece of asphalt while you're baking in the sun and at Fort Sill or 29 Palms, you know, it should be something cool. Like the, the army says, Hey, you know, Sergeant Van Zant, you know, um, thank you for re-enlisting. Um, we're going to give you, uh, seven days leave, uh, paid leave. And, you know, we're going to fly the you. Shirt or the mug. <laughs> yeah. No, nobody needs any more mugs or, or sweatshirts, but you know, what if I, what if I put you on a military flight to, to Bastogne and you got to see some of the history of the army or, or the Marines get a, a flight to watch the eighth and I silent drill team and all the history that lives in DC, just something small. You know, I think that, we could save a lot of money by doing that, but we could also be retaining some of the best and brightest people that feel that they're just constantly being ground down into found fine powder and, and not really cared for. But all of those things are, are part of a bigger piece. It's education and it's training and, and whether it's historical education or tactical training, maybe it's sending a guy to jump school. People stay with organizations because the leadership and the organization trains them. It's not because of bonuses. It's not because of cool uniforms or ribbons or medals that you get when you re-enlist. It's because people take the time and the resources to train them. That is where we have systematically and organizationally really failed to meet that in, in certain regards because we reserve that training for people that hit the seven, eight, 10 year mark and we send them on to a follow on school, we get them some higher education and, and then it pays off. But I think we could do a better job at that. Chris, I want to bring up a point with what you said about you had talked to a guy who his brother had never heard the real story. You kind of talk about that in the book too, Scott, where you talk to uh, Dustin's dad um, and he is asking you about what happened that night. Did he suffer? Can you walk us through that? Because that was a very intense part of the book. Yeah. Judd Libby was Dustin's dad. And, um, you know, I didn't meet those um, family members until we got back from the deployment at Camp Pendleton when we had a big family day. And, you know, I wanted to meet the family. Obviously, there was, you know, parties going on and a cookout and thousands of people down there from the community just supporting everybody from the whole battalion. But when Judd pulled me aside and he wanted to take a walk on the beach, you know, he, he cornered me and asked me very pointed questions about how his son died. And I hadn't mentally prepared myself for that question. I didn't expect it, but I also didn't want to lie to him. I didn't want to sugarcoat it, but I also didn't want to tell him all of the gritty details. Um, and it was tough uh, because I wasn't right there next to him when Dustin got shot. Um, I was there immediately after it happened and I took him to the battalion aid station and, you know, I, sh I shared that whole experience with him that how his son fought, how his Marines loved him, uh, dearly and they would have followed him into, into anything. And they did that night uh, as they fought for five hours in direct contact in a very complex, uh, well-coordinated firefight on on December 6th, uh, in Ramadi, um, you know, and I, I, I tried to explain to him how the, the corpsmen in the unit, the, the medics did, did everything they could. I did everything I could. The surgeons at the battalion aid station did everything they could, but it was just, uh, you know, one of those, one of those things that you couldn't turn back time on it. And, you know, Dustin was shot from, uh, insurgent fire in the back of the neck and, uh, you know, right above his protective, Kevlar and it was there was just really nothing we could do and it was it was a real tough night for our company because that kid was man he was just uh head and shoulders above the crowd as, as far as small unit leaders go and everybody loved him um and I do write about him extensively in the book because I'll be honest and, and I admit it in the book it was he was one of my favorites and you you do have favorites you don't talk about it um but you know, years later, you can admit it. And, uh, 
you know, he was one of my favorites just because of his style, the way he talked. He was very candid. There was no bullshit to this kid. Um, he, he always let you know where he was coming from. But he was also one of those quiet, cool professionals where the Marines respected and feared him because he was smart. And he was always taking care of business. But to share the details of that night with his dad was extremely tough for me. Um, I'm sure I probably cried on the beach, you know, when his dad put his arm around me. It's still really tough to talk about, but I'm still very connected to that family. I still go back to Maine. Uh, we still talk on the phone as brothers in South Carolina. Every single time I do an event and I'm on the East Coast, Chris Libby, his brother, he'll show up. Um, he was there when I rode my Harley across the country this year again uh, in support of Save the Brave. And, uh, you know, it's that type of connection when you really push yourself through all the pain and, and, and share a little bit of yourself. I think it really builds relationships as well, where some people just can't deal with that. I, I, I'll tell you this. I, I think I'm very, very fortunate to be able to one, share this story to, you know, get on my 1000th podcast and, and, you know, pick the scab open and bleed a little bit, but to have that capacity to share that, um, type of intimacy, there's just a lot of guys that can't do it. And I, I, I've heard it and I don't say this as any self congratulatory statement. I, it's because there's a lot of guys that just can't do it. And when I do it, when you do it, and you, you share a little bit of that, peop, it, people feel that it, it relieves and turns that pressure valve on their life a little bit that, that somebody else can talk about it because they're feeling that way. And, and it's been, uh, it's been pretty helpful for me um, just to stay connected. And that's one of the reasons too, why we started save the brave.org was to create another outlet for veterans and our warrior tribe that, they can feel connected in a safe space where it's not some boozy smoke filled VFW where guys are just sitting around telling the same war stories. We just don't do that. Uh, we want to make it cool. We want the events and the offshore fishing to be memorable and, and safe and cool in a place where guys can really stay connected and understand that they don't have to share if they don't want to, they don't have to be forced into those types of environments where there's an expectation that they're going to have to share. Somebody else does it for them. And sometimes that's all it takes. Chris, did you have a question to that? No, I, I, I agree with you, Scott, and, and God bless you for what you're doing and for writing the book. I mean, guys have said to me literally like, Hey man, I couldn't do it, but I'm so glad that you do. Um, and I think ex that's exactly to your point is that it's people are getting better about sharing and exposing, and it is helping to reduce that stigma and it is encouraging guys and making them feel more comfortable to, to seek help, to, to try to improve their lives and to try to get past those things that have happened to them. Well, it, it brings me to a serious point and it's something that I want to get into with this. Uh, Scott, I told you about Chris, uh, before we came on the show, but I have him on the show so much because how much I truly respect him and what he has done. He is one of those guys that will do just like what I said and tell you every mistake that he made and just lay it out there on the line. You're either going to listen to it or you're not. You're going to walk away from it or you're going to stick around to hear it. And that's that's truly why I respect him so much and bring him on these shows to talk. And that brings us into our next point that I think is the most important part of this book. I told you this before the show is mistakes. And you're not afraid to put them out there. You're not afraid to talk about them. And, and I want to get into the mindset of that because there's so many things we go to from here. Why were these mistakes made? Why is it so important to talk about them? And then on the back side of it, how much builds up before we start seeing bigger mistakes being made? So let's talk about why it was so important for you to talk about your mistakes in this book, because I, I told you it made me love this book a hundred times more when I read it. Well, I'd have to ask you which mistake, because there's more than one in the book. And uh, again, I, it, you know, it's, it's difficult to share some of those things. Um, but, you know, a lot of the mistakes I've made in I'm not embarrassed about them. I, I think that 
I'm probably more proud of the fact that I'm, I'm able to share those mistakes in hopes that other people won't screw up as bad as me. And I think there's probably some therapy to that. Um, not that I had to learn it, um, from a PhD, uh, caring psychiatrist. Um, but sharing those losses and, and the failures in my life, uh, it's, it's important uh, because I really feel like I have this um, commitment to ensuring that the future generation of Americans uh, and, and the military, um, you know, I use the example standing in front of 150 high school students from across the country at the Reagan Ranch Center just this week and, and, and sharing with them at such a young age how how I was a flawed individual growing up, how the military did so much for me. And it wasn't a, a paid recruiting spot to try and rope these guys and women into joining the military, but it was really an example of, look, when you screw up in life, there's hope. Um, you, you don't have to be a, a, a stellar sterling silver road scholar to be a success in life. As long as you're willing to admit your failures and your mistakes, do I hope that everybody, uh, you know, endures some some pain and suffering in their life to be a better person? No, I don't. I, I think that uh, whether it's um, my friends and family that, you know, I, I'd like to see them live their whole lives without having to endure some of the things that I've seen and done um, and endure to to really get to the point. But I, I think that those challenges and the, the shared pain and suffering, it builds a little character. Um, I've you know, started a little earlier in life, but when you're talking to young kids and even the military to share your losses, I think that there, there's, there's a little bit of satisfaction in, it in the fact that when you grow up in an organization that prides itself on being so a type and uh, these, this meat eater organization that is so deathly afraid of showing a weakness at any stage of their career, I think there's a lot of utility in that. I, I would say from an educational standpoint, the military uh, in and of itself should be bringing more guys like Chris and you and me on board to active duty units. And I think that, you know, you can pick one of the mistakes in my book and I'll pick it for you. Uh, you know, towards the end, towards the end when I was, I was struggling, I was, you know, drinking and, and self-medicating and, you know, almost killed myself one night. And, um, just through sheer idiocy and, and irresponsibility, that was a, that was a wake up call. Um, you know, and I'm not saying I haven't done stupid things since then. Um, there, there's no real fail safe to the level of stupid things that I will probably continue to do in my life. Other than the, the fact that I've learned from some of them and then I surround myself with people that, that take care of me to a degree and, and they're, they're there as a support network. And, my involvement as the executive director of SaveTheBrave.org, I think, really drives me to really help other people. Uh, and I believe this. It's not some bumper sticker that at the beginning and the end of every day, if, if I'm not helping other people, I, I really don't think I'm helping myself. And that drives us to do what we're doing. And we've continued to grow organizationally over the past seven years. So... You know, getting other people to admit their mistakes um, is is tough, uh, and I think that in the military, and, and th this is an example too of how we suck at it in the military. Is I, all the all the guys and women that I grew up with as as peers as an officer, these guys are all senior commanders now, uh, either at the battalion, brigade, regimental, division level. I mean, these, some of these guys who are my instructors now have stars on their collars and I interact with them and, and I tell them, I said, Hey, you know what I do in the nonprofit space to try and prevent veteran suicide, I think is very important. And it's a very qualitative metric of success that we use to understand our viability in this space that we're doing the right thing because we know we're helping other people because we get good feedback from those that have connected with us. And we're just one small part of the solution to stop people from killing themselves that think there's no solution that people don't want them to be around anymore. I got news for you. There's a ton of people that love you. There's a ton of people that want to help. All you got to do is ask. 
and we can't help everybody. And we understand there's going to be failures and those stick out more than most. But also those peers that we fought alongside in this 20 year war, they stayed on active duty. They've compartmentalized all of that trauma over the last 10 to 15 years. And I got news for you. When they get off active duty, they're going to have to unpack that baggage and they're going to have to dump that suitcase on the bed like everybody else did, or they're going to keep it locked in a room and they're not going to deal with it. And that's when bad things happen. But luckily through this network, through all the organizations that are tied into over 45,000 veteran support organizations registered with the IRS, there's a pretty decent safety net for guys. But I've gone back on base to Camp Pendleton and I've talked to commanders and I said, look, you got to get me in a room with all these guys. And I'm not talking about Lance corporals and sergeants that haven't even had one deployment. I'm talking about these guys who are my peers and I'm going to share with those guys, my failures, because I'll tell you what, when we were on active duty together, we weren't sharing that type of intimacy because there's that level of bravado and that type of mask of command you wear that you just don't do that because you don't want to be ostracized. You don't want to feel weak. Um, and you know, you can talk all day in the first responder community and the military community about, well, that stigma has been, you know, reduced and all this. No, nah, it, it has, but it hasn't. Um, you know, we're still guilty of it. Um, you know, pilots are deathly afraid of showing weakness because they don't want to get grounded. Infantry guys don't want to show weakness um, because they don't want to lose their clearance. They don't want to lose that next command. Uh, you know, it's still there. But when you get a guy like me that can stand on stage in front of 300 soldiers and Marines and tell them how it really is when you transition and some of the struggles and challenges you have, at least it gives them a conduit that they can go through and understand that there's a, a support structure out there when they do transition because the officers and the senior enlisted are the worst. They spend 20, sometimes 30 years of their life teaching, training, advising people how to be successful, how to get out of the military, how to get an education. And I'm talking about, there's some general level officers and sergeants, majors out there. They have no plan when they get out of the military, either career oriented or how to deal with the emotional or psychological stress that is incurred. Maybe it's even physical stress or financial stress but I'm telling you, we've got a pretty robust network just from shows like this, DJ, having Chris on and this network that we share. Because trust me, I could pick up my phone. People could ask me for anything. I won't soccer mom any contacts that I have. If there's somebody that I know being in this job and in, in, in the space that I'm in and, and having the luxury of meeting so many smart people, if people have a problem, I'm, I'm willing to share, period. Well, I was just going to say when you lost your rifle, but we got into a whole <laughs> nother area. Uh, I, <laughs> I was, I was going to do every, a simple mistake. Yeah. <laughs> Chris, go ahead. I, I know I you wanted to say no, something. There. I, I, I think it's, a, it's an <laughs> wait, wait a minute, Chris, hold on. Well, what was that Scott? I said, I didn't lose it for the record. I misplaced it. And thank God to my army brothers for taking care of the Marines again. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, I, I think it's, it's, um, it's kind of an interesting thought. Um, you're right, Scott. There is, there's a lot of great organizations. There's a lot of great people doing stuff um, for the veteran community, for post service. And I think we've we've come, we've made some huge strides in the last few years, in particular, um, in helping guys out, getting guys connected, um, and taking care of the community. Uh, but the active duty side is so is different, man. Like you. You know, my, my peer group on the officer side, those guys all have three and four stars on their collar right now. They're division commanders. Um, and I talk to them personally, like one-on-one, -on -one, and and I know in conversation, like they have the same struggles that we do. That, that They're just still putting it in the box in the corner because they're still serving and they're still leading those organizations. But I, I think the question that I always scratch my head on, and I'm curious to get your thoughts is, you know, other than exposing young soldiers or mid-career soldiers um, to individuals that can share stories and, and struggles and overcoming those struggles and whatnot, other than that, are there other things that you think can be done with active duty soldiers to kind of help that, um, that shock and all that happens when they leave the service? I think there's, it's a balance. 
it's it's just like some of the and they're not even hypothetical situations about critical race theory or uh, diversity in the military or all of these ancillary training requirements that are just thrust from top down that everyone's got to swallow and then you you talk about suicide prevention and and you know taking care of the force force you know the readiness of the force the health of the force the health of the transitioning force i think is something we don't allocate well I, I think we don't allocate enough time for it i don't think we see someone that serves four years or 24 years and we say hey look we're going to give you at least six months on the back end and we're going to pay you for this to get readjusted and th this is this is the problem you guys can understand this you you get a guy like me who's got 24 years 10 deployments uh, over 60 countries a lot of experience and I'm in the same pipeline getting pushed out of the Marine Corps as some corporal that spent four years. I've got the same administrator working on my paperwork and my uh, transition to the VA services as a four-year sergeant. I'm dealing with a Lance Corporal that you know is working my paperwork and I now have to educate this kid in the administrative field on how to properly process an officer and sadly, the four-year kid doesn't have the wherewithal to, to say to that clerk, hey, man, you screwed this up. I'm entitled to these rights and these benefits because if I can count one, I can count a couple dozen times from that four-year sergeant that's called me up and said, hey, sir, uh, I'm missing my Purple Heart on my DD-214 on my final paperwork. Hey, sir, uh, how do I get enrolled for the VA benefits that I'm entitled to? Hey, sir. Uh, my combat action ribbon isn't on my uh, discharge paperwork. And I think to myself, self, why did you not talk to this kid earlier? Or why did this person not come to me before they left active duty? It's because we have a lot of blind faith and confidence that the system is going to take care of it itself. But we're not allocating the proper amount of time to transition these people Um whether it's, again, it, it could be in any realm, psychologically, um, as far as career transition goes, our process in the Marine Corps sucks. It, it's it's ridiculous. You, we've got a, a system where there's a civilian contractor that's teaching a 24-year-old major with prior enlisted, uh, with my experience, how to build a LinkedIn profile. Come on, man. Seriously, that's not what I need to spend a day in my life doing uh, from a guy that's successfully deployed 2,500 Marines and sailors from three different amphibious ships to seven countries. I got LinkedIn, man. Trust me. What we really need is how to leverage the network, how to really talk at the right level and have the right people talking about the right things. And sadly, uh, that costs time and that costs money. So every rock you put in the pack, you know this, it just adds weight. So um, I think that there's really a prioritization of what is the most important thing. And if everything's important, nothing's important. And we all get that. I don't know if that answered the question, but it's my own no, perspective I, on it. Yeah. And I, like I said, it's, it's an interesting thought. I, I've always said to guys, like I, I sort of transitioned while still on active duty. I got, I got lucky in hindsight, looking back on it. I didn't leave from deploying to combat to being a civilian when I retired. I, I did my last five years doing doing staff work um, and staff work surrounded by guys that had been at war for a whole bunch of years, just like me, and were at the tail end of their career. And while it wasn't a it wasn't a clinical environment, per se, um, it allowed me some time to work through some issues before I was no longer wearing a uniform. And I think that was huge. Like, I don't know that I would be here had I gone from, you know, being at war to the street um, in retirement thinking that everything was going to be good. So I think there's some merit to, you know, some work being done on, on how we transition and how much time period that takes. Everybody seems to focus on, you know, getting a soldier set up on the outside. Well, <laughs> the things that made him great as a soldier is the same stuff that'll make him great on the outside. How about, how about getting his headspace right and making sure he's good with who he is and what he is and what he's done so that he can approach that with the same veracity that he did his military career. Agree. hundred percent. So here's my question to, to kind of both of you, Chris, you and I have talked about it a, a bunch of times. We keep talking about unpacking, throwing that suitcase on the bed, just like everyone has to, 
But I'm I'm wondering, coming from an officer standpoint, coming from a senior enlisted guy, why is it so hard and why do we leave that box locked up for so long until it finally breaks open? And it seems to do it more often than not. And that's in law enforcement too. We just keep stacking and stacking and stacking and saying, we'll deal with it later. Why, why is it so hard to deal with it in the present and get ready for the future? Uh, I'll go first. I think, uh, for active duty guys or for, for, and this is a very small percentage of, of Marines and soldiers that have seen combat that have seen the type of intense combat that, that we were exposed to for heightened periods for sustained periods. Um, it's, I, I almost think it's easier for those types of individuals to unpack it. Um, because the group is so small, uh, in conversations I have, um, comparatively with law enforcement or uh, firefighters, I tell you what, uh, the types of things that firefighters see, that cops see, it's not, it's almost more difficult, I think, because it's this slow drip of trauma over an entire career. Um, yeah, you can, you can do a lot of deployments, but not every deployment is, uh, combat sling and lead and, and steel and, and rockets and mortars but for the the type of human tragedy that cops deal with the the physical stress that they deal with that's a daily thing um and i think that that's probably why we're so closely al aligned with firefighters and cops is you know they're paramilitary organizations structurally but i think the types of traumas and stressors that they see really makes it relatable and you know there, there's a lot of guys that i'm close close friends with and you know they understand my story they've read the book or, or you know they've talked to me and you know, there, there's kind of this reverence for fighting and you know killing bad guys but i look at them in, in the same vein and i think there's no way i could do what you do and to see some of the, the most horrific things that they they roll upon i mean they're eating donuts one day in the you know the cop shop or you know spaghetti at the firehouse and then they roll out and they have to see some of the worst car accidents or shootings or man it the list goes on it's almost endless um but i think back to your question is how you store that and and how you unpack all that trauma it's a pretty personal issue for most people. And I think that when you're in a space or you're in a community that is accepting of that, or you connect with that, that really goes back to everything we do at Save the Brave is our mission is to connect veterans who are struggling with post-traumatic stress through outreach programs. That's our mission. And we do that by offering individuals a safe space where they can do that. We don't force them to do it. We don't ask them to do it. We asked them moreover just to share the experience on the trip and how helpful it was. I think that by presenting opportunities to individuals where they feel safe with their own breed, uh, their own tribe, uh, because there, there really is uh, no one else that can understand it. That's why there's a VFW or the American Legion. That's why there's cop bars. That's why there's firefighter bars and restaurants and, and gathering places because those types of communities really relate. Uh, I think if we walked into a doctor's lounge, they'd have the same stories and I couldn't relate to them. Or if I went to a tax accounting bar, I couldn't understand that. So we just need to be conscious. My God, of, that would be the worst bar ever. <laughs> I, yeah, I would never want to walk in there uh, unless I need my tax done. But um, <laughs> I, I think it's, just a, it's a great example of, you know, you shouldn't be ashamed of what you've done and seen. And you should really seek out those that can help support you. Chris, you want to add on to that? Yeah, I mean, I think from a military's perspective, and it's probably law enforcement and, and, and first responders as well, I think some of the boxing this stuff up and, and shoving it in the closet and, and not dealing with it is a conditioned response. It's it's like you, you almost train yourself to do it. And in combat in particular, you know, when you experience loss in combat, you there is no time to to grieve. There's no time to discuss it. You move on to the next mission because you have to. So 
it, it's almost a, a learned action um, for soldiers a lot of times in that I just shove it away and I focus on the task at hand because I don't want to die and I don't want anybody else to die or anybody else to get hurt. So I'm going to leave that there for now. And then over time, you do that enough times, it just becomes the course of action that you do with trauma. Um, I think one of the ways that we combat that is exactly what we're all trying to do, which is share stories and talk about it and make people be comfortable with that something affected you or bothered you or whatever it was and that that's okay. Um, you know, I, sometimes I try to do it in funny ways, like, and tell guys, like if you served, if, if you were a first responder, law enforcement, you're in the military, whatever, like you've, you've earned your man card, not to make it masculine, but you get my point in that you are who you are, your actions and your decisions and your choices speak for themselves. So why would you ever be worried about going, man, you know what? I'm really upset about this, or this really bothered me. Um, so I think the more that people talk about it, I think that network of support, I think that community of guys, like Scott was saying, you know, and, and like I had at the tail end of my career, I had an office full of dudes that were actually all, we were all kind of learning at the same time how to be comfortable with having those conversations with each other because I wasn't in that scenario anymore. And then focusing on that more towards transition and giving guys healthy ways to deal with it, healthy ways to talk about it and a healthy environment to discuss it that isn't that isn't um, over a bottle um, or or only when you're in those circumstances. So, yeah, I think there's some conditioning. I think just uh, some of it is a necessary evil. I think sometimes you just have to compartmentalize things um, to get through whatever it is. But um, learning how to unpack it is the key. Scott, I want to ask you something about when you talked about because you, you talked about the uh, the accident the day after Christmas. When you talk about that in the book, it's so visceral how you talk about it, that you had put down pills and you'd been drinking all day and stuff. With the self-medication and everything that we're talking about tonight, about being able to explain how we're feeling, why is it at that time that you felt like you couldn't explain it? Because you say in there that you were taking medicine for injuries, you were drinking heavily, you had you had some outlets there. You had a wife and things like that. Why was it that you kept all this locked away? Why didn't you look for a different way? I think you just, again, as Chris was saying, you develop these routines and, uh, you know, personally, I, I don't really have any exp explanation uh, or rationalization for it other than I think that you, you build this, sense of toughness up in your head that you can handle this, that you're, you know, the, the drinking's not that bad. Um, you know, you're, you're taking pain meds, um, you know, because I was in legitimate pain, uh, and just not managing it properly. Um, and, and also just, you know, I was at a point in my life, um, you know, and I don't think picking the scab open and, and writing about it was, um, really any contributing factor that I was reliving some of this because writing the book wasn't some sort of cathartic event for me. It was, it was very businesslike. I, I mean, writing's a, is something that I just do and that I've always done, but the, the irresponsibility was, you know, not looking two, three steps ahead of, of how that was going to not only impact me, but the people around me was, it was just completely irresponsible. Um, and I think that it was a real hard lesson learned for me. And to be quite honest, to be able to share that was pretty difficult. Um, when I wrote it, that chapter specifically, and I shared it with some people that were close to me, you know, they gave me the eyebrow, man. And they said, you're really going to put this in a book and barf this into 300 pages and hang it in, you know, Amazon and every bookshelf in Barnes and Noble and Costco that you're going to do this. And I said, man, I have to do this. I, I have to do this if I'm going to be true as a writer and <clears throat> honest as a Marine. And, 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 you know, it's part of, you know, being an artist is, is sharing a little bit of yourself. And when you pull so much pain in those stories from the hundreds of interviews I did with everybody that's included in the book, I really felt from a, not as a writer, more as a leader that I, I owed it to them. Like, like they gave to me, man, I, I, I can't rip all this 
personal emotional stuff from all the people that are in the book and not give of myself and that was really something i learned from my editor sylvia mendoza when she read through the manuscript she said man there's just so much great stuff in the way you talk and develop the characters in this book of these real people but there's not enough you in the book and you know sadly that was one of the most embarrassing and shameful days of my life and you know if i was willing to share that i i thought again as a as a writer and as a leader to be able to share that type of failure that that difficult day that i was still in and to this day i've, I've moved past it that type of shame sticks with you the most. It wasn't the pain from the car wreck. It wasn't the fact that I could have killed somebody else that night. It was really the shame that it just washed over me and that hung over me for a long, long time. And for a very, very, very long time, I didn't even drink. I, I couldn't even go near it. And, you know, I've learned to manage that type of pain. I've learned to manage the physical pain in different ways um, and get better. Um, you know, there's no cure, but I think that, it again, there's no prescription there's no bottle there's no therapy session that really is any better for me than this staying connected and i'll be honest with you this is the second podcast that i've done today um some days i do a couple some days i i see them on my calendar and i think ah man i gotta do another podcast and i gotta pick the scab but you know every time i hit the button and I dial in and we get into conversations with, with people like you or total civilians, it, it really helps um, because it really affirms everything I talk about and it's not a bumper sticker. Being connected to people like you and adding a couple more contacts in my phone, part of the network, I really think until the day I die, it's, it's probably going to be one of the greatest gifts that I'm going to be able to give myself and to give back to others is is when someone's struggling and they say, oh, I was in the army and, or I was a, I'm a cop in, in Texas. And be like, I know a guy you need to talk to DJ or Hey, I know this guy, Chris Van Zandt. Like you need to talk to this guy. Like he's spot on to be able to share that through what I've shared. That's, that's where it all comes back. And I think that's a part of not only just leadership, but, but giving as well. Well, I noticed that you didn't say that the best podcast that you were on today was this one. And I'm glad, you know, they say you save the best for last. But here's the last question that I have about that that kind of stuff. When you spill all of that out and you just lay your guts out in that book and, and you talk about the most shameful part in your life, do you ever worry in the back of your head these guys that I, I was in command of for so long that I tried to lead the way for, they're going to think I'm a phony. They're going to think that what I told them didn't really mean anything because I was doing stuff too. Or do you think this is the best thing for all of them? I think it's the best thing for everybody. I think that when you reach a point in your career, when you reach a point in your life, um, that you can share that type of uh, intimacy and, and, and failure. I think um, this is just testimony that I've heard repeated back to me is, is people are grateful for it. I, I think that um, when you expose that part of yourself, it, it really builds trust. Um, and, and people understand, you know, I did all those things too. Chris could be sitting on all of that powder keg right now and he's never admitted it. And, and maybe there's a guy that comes into his life and, and I'm using him as a crude example, but it, it gives him a little bit of, of license and freedom to say, you know what, if that guy did it and could admit he was all screwed up at a point in his life and got better and, and, and managed to, to regroup, I could do the same thing. And, and I'm not saying you have to admit it. I'm not saying you have to barf your life into 300 pages of a, of a book and, put it out there for everybody to read. But I, I think that it, I don't, I don't feel, and I've never heard that back from anybody. I think it's been the complete opposite. DJ is, is people have thanked me like, man, that's some authentic hard hitting stuff that you shared. And, uh, you know, sometimes the answer is, or the response is, you know, I, I wish I could do that. Uh, I, w I wish I could share that. And I tell people when you're ready, you share it on your own time. Um, and then there's other people that, 
you know, say, Hey, th because of what you shared, I was able to share. And, and that's, that's a win, man. Um, you know, there's wins on the battlefield and there's wins in life. And, you know, if you can reach one person and, you know, I've got a thousand stories and, and thousands more emails from people that reach out to me on social media and, and email or through my websites and, and thank me for sharing those stories and, and just sharing the, the other stories that are in the book too, that give them an understanding of the sacrifices of so many people at such a young age and the families to be able to see that through my lens has really been a gift. And, um, I, I don't regret a single word that I wrote. I don't regret a single thing that I write to this day and share my opinions and thoughts. And you know, a lot of people are just too damn scared to, to speak up. Um, and, and I stay pretty balanced as, as far as where I lean on the political spectrum, because I got opinions on both sides. Um, but the one thing that I'm not afraid to talk about is everything I fought for. I don't live in the past because I don't care about what I did. I spent 24 years in the Marines, big deal. But what am I doing now? I'm helping other people now. I'm still writing now. I'm still working in, I'm working on films now. Uh, I'm working as a agent. Uh, you know, I don't a even advertise it to help share other veteran authors stories. And I've sold four other bestsellers. Um, and I don't want any credit for it. Sure. I get paid for it. I'm not a sucker. Uh, you know, everybody's time is valuable, but, uh, you know, I think that those types of, uh, minuscule bites of feedback that I get from sometimes total strangers, not even veterans, man, it, you know, you need something to drive you through in life. That that's all it takes for me. And to really keep doing what I'm doing now, um, you know, the merit meritocracy of the military seems to be this great thing about, um, being rewarded for what you've done, man. I be honest with you, the veterans that I deal with, they don't want any help transitioning. They don't want any recognition. They don't want anything given to them for free and they don't care about what they've done, what they care about. And the people that I'm surrounded by, they care about what they're doing now and what they're going to do in the next five years. Those are the people I want to be surrounded by. And if there's a message that I'm sharing daily, um, it's that, um, you know, it's, it's, very complimentary um and i'm very grateful that people want to talk about the book um and you know hopefully it'll be the same way when, our, when my next book comes out um but it's really that's really the true ethos and of what we do in the military is not what you did but what are you capable of doing i'm, I'm not going to promote you as a cop or as a military service member for what you did. I'm promoting you for what you're capable of doing. And I think that's the message that I'm trying to share with people in life. Well, and, and the reason I ask you that, and the reason I phrased it that way, I think, and I'm speaking strictly from my point of view, having been in law enforcement for as long as I've been in it and having to have that, you have to have a certain outer surface. It's just the way it is being in law enforcement and being in front of people like that, that would make me fear so bad. And I know that when I read the book, I, I would be so fearful of doing that because of me personally thinking that someone might go, man, I can't listen to that guy anymore. That's what would scare me. And that's why I love that part of the book so much that you were so open to do it because I know knowing me that I, I would be afraid to do that. Yeah, I, I think, you know, even sharing the story about me misplacing my rifle, like <laughs> there's just not a lot of guys that will admit that. And uh, I think, again, is, you know, you share stuff like that. Um, right. And there's a little bit of comedy to it, um, but it also it makes you human. And, and there's probably, you know, 80,000 other soldiers and, and Marines that have done the exact same thing. You're like, oh, man, I remember the time I did that. And, yeah, it does. To, it does take a little bit of personal courage to, to share those things. But again, uh, I think that that's the, that's really the unifying factor is, um, yeah, I'm, I'm lucky to know a lot of successful people too, but I also know a lot of people like myself. Um, and the more, the more people I'm fortunate to be surrounded by that are willing to be a little bit humble and, and more authentic with themselves, I, I just see them as, contributors you know they come from this small segment of society like you guys that are protectors um and they take off the uniform or they they hang up the badge and, and gun and they figure man what am i going to do now well 
you're going to do the same thing you've been geared to your whole life because it didn't start when you joined the force. It didn't start when you joined the military. You were born and you were raised as a small part of society. And, and I guarantee if you guys ask yourselves this question, what part of my young adult life or what part of my childhood did I also exhibit these same types of characteristics as a protector to take care of other people that couldn't take care of themselves? I guarantee you there was something in your life that did that, or there was someone in your life that drove you down that path to where we're all sitting here today. Um, I know there's those points in my life too. Um, but I th again, you know, being able to share those types of wins and losses, I think really is the most important thing. Let's talk about everything that you're doing right now. I want to talk about uh, the organization Save the Brave. Uh, you're also the president of the 2nd Battalion, 4th Marine Association. Uh, is that still current right now as being president? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Um, you know, my role as the executive director of Save the Brave is, again, um, I know we've we're got a lot of ground to cover and, uh, you know, we've talked about a lot. Um, so I'll try and keep it brief, but it's important work that we're doing the, the, as the executive director of Save the Brave, like many things in the veteran space, it was born through tragedy when one of my squad leaders, who I wrote about, Simon Licky, killed himself in Minnesota. And another Marine, Nick Velez, who's the president of Save the Brave, asked me to help him. We flew a bunch of Marines to support the family in Minnesota. And uh, we came back and we just decided we wanted to do more. And we threw some money in the bank, very grassroots over a kitchen table. and. We took some guys offshore fishing. That was seven years ago. Last year, we took uh, over 200 veterans out on 30 different trips and continuing to grow uh, and really prevent veteran suicide, not raise awareness, but prevent it. Uh, I don't want to wave a flag and say, hey, people are killing themselves. Veterans need help. We want to try and find a way to solve the problem. And when I'm out on a fishing trip or the guys are out or I'm riding my Harley across the country, we're not talking about politics or any of the noise on the social and political landscape. We're talking about ways to really practically solve this problem. And we're out there asking people to donate. Like your donation, whether it's 10 bucks a month, less than the cost of a tank of gas in California, at least in most states, is really going to make a difference because we're creating a once in a lifetime opportunity to reconnect these people and show them that they can do it themselves. We're not, again, giving anything for free. We're connecting people, we're empowering them to show them that they can do it, and that's how we continue to serve our veteran tribe. And that's our ethos, to connect, empower, and serve. And I think we've been su successful um, in so many ways. Uh, there hasn't been a day I've woken up that I've told myself, man, are we doing the right thing? Are we helping people? I know we are, uh, by the feedback we're getting and by what we continue to do. Our organization continues to grow not only in size um, with the right people, but programs. Um, the fishing program has been vastly successful um, to the point where we started a jujitsu program and they're modeling that. It's very physical, everything we do. But one of the things we're very keenly aware of is the families that are left behind in the wake of veteran suicide. And one of the proudest days of my year uh, so far was being in San Francisco in August and presenting a $10,000 scholarship check to Kayla Turner, who's um, the daughter of a Marine who committed suicide last year. And whew, man, I tell you, I couldn't think of being in college and someone handed me a check. Um, we drove back and I was talking to her uncle, Pete Turner, who's the creator of the podcast that uh, I co-host. And, uh, you know, I just told him, I said, man, that's life changing is absolutely life-changing to be a part of that where you know you could just really change someone's life and we didn't want any bureaucracy involved with it we didn't want to you know make it hard or complicated you know we have an application process you can go to save the brave.org um, it's for the children or deserving family members of veterans who've committed suicide and we want to be a part of their continued success through some of the worst experiences that, that anyone could even deal with. And, and we swim in these waters and we know how extremely important it is to the families to really help them out. So we're going to continue to do what we do. And we can't do it without donor support. We can't do it without volunteers. And, you know, we're going to continue to do that. 
um, you know, my involvement in the nonprofit space is, is again, something that really sustains me um, and just brings a ton of great people into my life. Um, you know, we talked about some of them on the show and before the show, but um, I think that everybody, again, like joining the military or sharing personal experiences, being involved in philanthropy at some level, I think is a personal decision that you can't really force anyone into it. They have to find that for themselves and that's that's what i'm really driven to do can we talk about the motorcycle ride across uh, the united states again something born out of tragedy that um you know my uh my buddy dave white who i went to high school with uh navy vet great guy got a phone call three years ago from his mom dave drank himself to death in montana and she wanted me to come out and give the eulogy in South Carolina, high to COVID, no flights. I said, you know, screw it. I'm going to hop on my Harley and I'm going to ride to South Carolina and back 5,150 miles along the Southern route, triple digit heat. And it just really became this forced gump like event that took off and, you know, Marines and soldiers being soldiers, you know, use shame as a powerful tool. And they <laughs> asked me to do it again um the next year and then the next year and it, it just has continued to grow and you know we got to one point on the ride i think um last year the year before and i was really kind of perseverating on the goal we had set as a fundraiser and i think we probably hit tallahassee and nick velez um he said to me he goes hey sir stop worrying about the money he goes if we hit the goal we hit the goal he said we've connected thousands of veterans at every city, nine cities in nine days last year alone, thousands of people came out to support. We raised fifty-two thousand dollars, over fifty-two thousand dollars, and you know, Nick just slapped me in the face uh, figuratively and, and said, "This is our mission: connecting veterans." And we did that. And you know, sometimes uh, the answer is right in front of your face. And we're going to do the ride again next year. Um, same stops, same route, the southern route. It's you know, triple-digit heat humidity but um that's my legacy to this ride is that uh it'll always be in july it'll always be along the southern route because it's become a metaphor um that i think that you know people should suffer a little bit um, we're masters of it in the military and especially in the infantry you know i think it's a reminder that there's people that are struggling in life and there's a lot worse things than hopping on your harley and going from city to city and, and meeting you know so many great people that care and they come out and support and they ride along with me and man it's just it's really um over the last three years despite everything else exposed the best of the human condition um as i continue to do this and you know it's it's one event that we do for um, save the brave.org and you can find out all the cities or go to save the brave.org if you ride a motorcycle and you live in california arizona texas louisiana all the way to south carolina Go to savethebrave.org, click on Ride for the Brave. All the cities are listed, and you can sign up to our newsletter now, and you can be a part of this. And, you know, we're, we're getting better about planning this ride. I planned it in 16 days the first year we did it, and we raised a ton of money. But we're going to continue to do what we do and, you know, be great at what we're great at. And just like you having me on the show today and, you know, sharing part of my story and what we're doing, it just all becomes another volume in the Encyclopedia Britannica of people that really care and provide a solution to, you know, what people might be dealing with. I'm glad you do it. I've been wanting to test out my Vespa and see if I could get it cross country. So Bring it. Uh, if you don't, uh, don't mind me joining in the pack. Uh, so where can people find you, Scott? Well, if you want to buy a copy of the book, you can, Go to Amazon. A portion of the proceeds do get donated to SaveTheBrave.org, but you can buy a copy of Echo Nermati on Amazon. You can buy it at Barnes & Noble, whatever. Just type in Echo Nermati. Uh, Amazon, you can buy it uh, all different flavors, hard cover, soft cover. It's available on Audible. Very well done uh, narration from my good friend and, and New York actor, Dave Morantz. Um, if people want to get a hold of me, um, you can find me at SaveTheBrave.org. You can find me at scotthusing.com. You can find out more about the Echo Company Marines at Um And on social media, you can find me at Echo and Ramadi on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, 
pretty easy, pretty easy to get a hold of. But um, I think you know if I I had to you know leave this show with something is uh, not only when I was in the military and what I'm doing now in the veteran space is um, you know I shared this with this group that group of kids this week too is um, part of my success is every day I'm I'm trying to do four things I'm I'm trying to educate myself and, and spend time reading you know at least an hour. I try and do something physical every single day. I try and put myself in an uncomfortable position, whether it's on a new platform, a new podcast, uh, maybe it's just something physical in my workout that I just normally don't do. And then the fourth thing I do every day is try and find time to help somebody else besides myself. Um, and you know, the, the other 20 hours of the day, uh, I challenge people listening or watching the show just to do whatever they want with. Um, you know, you can sleep, eat, go to work, do whatever it is, but you know, just carve out a little time for yourself every single day and be disciplined and lead yourself. That's probably the biggest challenge of my life has been transitioning away from leading thousands of Marines uh, to leading one person in my company and being successful and, and being a resource provider to myself. It's pretty tough some days, but that's the answer. There's no secrets, man. You just got to do the work and that that's what we're all geared to do. And I just, you know, want... I want to say thanks to both you and Chris for having me on the show and uh, give me the opportunity. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys. And in, in, uh, I'll be down in Dallas um, as the guest of honor at the Marine Corps birthday ball at the Marine Corps League in Frisco, Texas on November 13th. I think that's a Saturday, 12th or 13th. You guys have to check the calendar, but it's on Eventbrite. Um, you can find it online at uh, Marine Corps League, Frisco, Texas. And then I'll be back down in Texas. So we'll definitely link up. But I just want to say Thanks to both of you guys, everybody out there listening. Appreciate you and Semper Fi. Chris, where can people find you? Uh, Instagram at cvansant123. Uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, and then uh, All Secure Foundation, uh, allsecure.com or .org, excuse me. Uh, Scott, I just want to say thanks um, for being on the show and for allowing me to be a part of it. Appreciate the book. Appreciate the charitable work that you do. And appreciate the fact that you're still out there leading the veteran and, and active duty community um, and leading by example. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, Scott, uh, you have a great story. I'm so glad we got together and, and made this happen. Uh, you know, I think uh, we've covered, like you said, a lot of things tonight. And I think there's still more to cover. I think, I think that there's still a lot of ground to cover. That's for the next time, guys. You know, always, if you want to find me, you can find me on Instagram at the DTD underscore podcast. You can find me on Facebook at the DTD podcast. And you can find me on YouTube where all these conversations are in video form at the DTD podcast. But the one-stop shop, it's dtdpodcast.net. It's audio. It's video. It's pictures of Scott. It's pictures of his career. It's pictures of what he's doing now and how to get a hold of him in every different way by the links that are on there. Guys, also, don't forget, go to our sponsor, Police Coffee, at policecoffee.com. You know they're an officer-owned business. You know they're dedicated to crafting the finest coffees and blends, and they're shipped to you as soon as they're made to provide you with the freshest coffee available. Each batch is roasted fresh by people who know what it means to stay vigilant, and their specialty coffees do not waste one drop when flavor is concerned. There's coffee some of the best you'll find, but it also helps serve an important cause. It gives back to our community. 50% of the profits go towards helping family members of police officers who fell in the line of duty. Don't forget, policecoffee.com. They just released their pumpkin spice for this season. We know how everyone loves that. And when you go to their website, make sure you put in DJK10 to get 10% off your order. That's going to be it for tonight, guys. Thank you so much, Scott. Thank you, Chris. That's going to be the show. We'll catch you guys on the next one. See you later.